Really? I've never seen that. I don't know. It just did it? Did a bug anyone else to see that? No? Was it just me? Yeah. yeah. I was just curious how it became so commercialized. I wasn't starting, Andrew, but thanks. That was... You're good. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, as our presenter said um, earlier today, there was a few lacking qualities. Fortunately, or I guess unfortunately, you guys nailed it on the head. Can you uh, un... I got it. Hey, do you want me to push your slides for you? No, I got it. So the stuff I thought was lacking was something you guys already addressed today. So the feminine, and then also what Andrew was talking about, like the non-existence. And so it's interesting to see, because of the, the yin and yang, they're always deemed as complementary, but in uh, specifically Lao Tzu, he really favors the feminine, and he favors non-existence over existence and the masculine qualities. So that's something I wanted to really draw out. It's not really prevalent in Dronza, the other founder or founding figures of philosophical Taoism. So it's something that needs to be addressed, I think. So uh, Rachel already pointed out a few of them, but I just have some more quotes here. Mm. The spirit of the valley does not die. This is called dark femininity. The gate of dark femini femininity, this is called root of heaven and earth. Mm. And so the way I read this, it's like the feminine aspect. It's like the potentiality. It's like at the, the threshold of actuality from which everything comes and returns. And I think that's why the feminine aspect is stressed so much. And then I think the other one. All right. So a large state is low-lying waters, the female of the world, the connection of the world. The female overcomes the male by constant stillness. Mm -hmm. Because she is still, she is therefore unfitted, or she is therefore fittingly underneath. So I think there's a lot to be said about this. And just so that we're clear, state here is not like the Confucian state. Uh, Lao Tzu had a completely different understanding of state than what we saw in Confucianism in the last week. So I think, oh, please. Um, oh, I was just going to say, I had something on that. About the state? And About the state, mm -hmm. yeah. And how he was saying that I wrote government slash ethics. It's like, in matters of state, therefore, rulers and other policymakers should imitate the female principle, both in nature and in human sexual relations. Um, so yeah, it went through a lot of this, like the female always overcomes the male by mm -hmm. tranquility. Uh, and by tranquility, she is underneath. A big state can take over a small state that places itself below the small states. And the small state can take over a big state if it places itself below the big state. Thus, some, by placing themselves below, take over others, and some, by being naturally low, take over other states. Hmm. So what I was reading was that, like, the, like, yeah, you're supposed to govern <laughs> right, through right. these feminine principles. Right, right. And so that's another misunderstanding with the, especially the Lao Tzu, like, it's a political text. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's talking, he's talking to rulers how to govern. It's not the, the hippie phase that we saw, the <laughs> age of Aquarius that we were just talking about earlier. We saw this illustrated in that last painting with the two people in the boat, you know, in the stillness with all of the mm -hmm. nights of the mm -hmm. waterfall coming down. Yeah, so the imagery, is, I think, is beautiful, the way it's um, formulated here. So, I mean, it leads to questions. And I, I guess I'll preface it before we go into the question <laughs> aspect, but... What drew me to these quotes is, I mean, it's a very Western idea, like to be strong, powerful, rigid, male, right? But uh, you would think possibly that's not the perception they had in, in China at the time, but apparently it was. And so even, even in ancient China, this was radical to, to highlight that aspect as opposed to, to male. And then, I mean, when we think of legalism, right, like rule with force, that's the way you do it. So we have these competing uh, theories on, on the Tao. I'm looking at a different translation of it, and one of the lines, which I, I think is pertinent, um, the great state only wishes to unite men together and nourish them. Mm -hmm. is nourish, what right. Translate it, which is wild. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if anyone looks at the original uh, scriptures, like the Taoist scriptures, and, and if you know anything about classical Chinese, traditional Chinese, it is amazingly difficult. Uh, 
It's not so difficult to translate, like you could pick out the words, but then formulating them in something we would understand. And even in uh, modern day Chinese, it's, it's still a challenge. So I mean, the, yeah, there's so many different interpretations. And I mean, you can be very poetic about it, you can be very rigid about it, so. All right, so given Smith's text in Novak, what we've seen in the previous passage that I just presented, so why do you suppose the feminine is favored over the masculine? Like, what do you think Lao Tzu or you know whoever wrote the the Tao Te Ching was thinking when he formulated this this radical thought? He perceives uh, feminine um, as usually being uh, considered the weaker part. Mm -hmm. But he sees uh, the stronger characteristics in the feminine. Right. Yeah, no, that's interesting. So it's almost as if the weaker eventually just would overcome the strong, right, by remaining more passive, right. that eventually they'll win out. And I think someone made the illustration about the rock going into the water, right, like a sharp rock. It's strong, it's rigid, but after time, just going with the water, it's going to be worn down. And eventually, it's just water and then a round rock. Mm -hmm. The thing about passivity that I found interesting is actually that it's not saying that the Tao that's feminine is necessarily a passive thing. It was saying that mm -hmm. it was the form of being, actually. Mm -hmm. And it was the active agent that created change. And it was like the the act of, what is it, like, gener generativity? What's that word? Mm -hmm. Like, like yeah, producing. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so... The feminine, like you said, I mean, it's the womb. It's like what everything comes from. Right. It comes from there and it dies from there. So that's what I found fascinating was that I didn't feel like it was saying the feminine energy was passive. Well, not passive. I, well, as a matter of fact, it, um, in in uh, Smith, uh, it's saying one of the reasons they look to water so much is it's infinitely supple yet incomparably strong, which mm -hmm. is something you could put on them. So uh, I guess when I said passivity, it's more of like um, intensities. And I feel where, I mean, strong brute power, like it burns out quick. It's not going to be longevity. It's not going to remain for very long. Yeah. I, I also wondered when I first read um, the, um, the background of Lao Tzu. He, it doesn't mention much about his dad, but you know, the legend says that her mom, his mom um, was, was <coughs> having him in the womb for 82 years. Mm -hmm. And so it says about a little bit about maybe his mom had a very, um, is very strong, um, maybe a still but strong person. So mm. I'm sure that there's some influence from from childhood. Mm. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's a good possibility. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just guessing. No, right. I've never thought yeah. about the, the like the mythical links and stories about him. Because I mean, it's debated if he's a real person or not. But uh, just as if the West we call God He. That mm. creates all sorts of expectations on gender. Right. If the Tao is understood as a womb, that has all kinds of influences on gender perception. Mm -hmm. That's a huge point. And yeah. the, the thought that the greatest Lao Tzu would have been held in a womb of a woman and come out as an old man, that was the womb of the Tao. But it also exalts the female mm. in a way that the West usually didn't. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, too, I think coming from an Asian background, I I see um, China, Hong Kong. I think we we see um, gender as more neutral than than, than American than the Western world. Somehow, we thought that you know women are supposed to be submissive in Asian countries, but mm -hmm. you see a lot of women they can climb up without a glass ceiling. Um, wasn't even a question um, hmm. in some of the Asian countries. More so interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's influenced by. Uh, like specific countries or just well i can't say about korea or japan but the rest that i've been talking to other people and from my own cultural background mm -hmm. certainly um there's not much of a glass feeling of uh, right well i think even in the west we even though we tend to be uh, chauvinistic but i mean there's we always <clears throat> recognize the nourishing agency of like the feminine like it's always there underneath even though we don't explicitly recognize or make make much of it at times. Sorry, go ahead. No, it's, um, I was going to say with respect to the feminine, uh, feminine principle, it's like I think what I, I have to think of uh, receptivity, responsivity, right. and sense of uh, 
you know, looking at a way of life and, and, and adapting to life, going with the flow of life mm -hmm. according to the situation. And I think of like, uh, you know, this idea that I think it's if it's a full moon that the weeds actually get pulled easy, much easier. So mm -hmm. when the gardener goes out, I think it's a full moon, there's a certain mm -hmm. day like this, that actually if you go and you weed, they just, the roots just come out naturally. And like using that kind of wisdom to, to kind of First, discerning that and then applying that right, right, right. is a way like that can be applied to all sorts of situations in life. Right. Mm -hmm. Next. If the moon is young. We'll yeah. Is it, okay, yeah. Mm. I think one could also say the feminine has kind of a synthesizing quality, kind of like listening to things, whereas mm -hmm. the masculine is more of an analytic quality, more like the sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These are all really good insights. Also, since um, Lao Tzu, um, Emphasize the use the usage of emptiness more than the the concreteness, right? Mm -hmm. um, the feminine, I think, it can be compared to the because it's to the emptiness because it's more like recessive. Right, right. Recessive. Whereas, see, you're a genius, Jim. You're you're going <laughs> exactly where I was going. So this is where you know non-existence is getting favored over existence, which is like right. another. Especially in Western discourse, right? God is being practically. If we're going to use Christianity as an example here, did you have a comment? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I did. Um, I mean, another another image that is evoked in the Tao Te Ching for the Tao is the nameless uncarved block. So mm -hmm. there's this formless, shapeless, timeless quality to the Tao, mm -hmm. um, which I mean lends itself naturally to nothingness, and also this kind of receptivity negativity or hiddenness, all the negative attributes that we ascribe in kind of a bifurcated mode of thinking mm -hmm. is ascribed to the Tao because of the fact that the Tao is, this, you know, in the Tao you're synthesizing everything because the Tao itself is the generative principle of all things. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the uncarved blog I like because, it, I mean, has the potentiality to be anything, really, right? So it's just, it's just beautiful illustration. So Andrew already took my, my fire. <laughs> so, uh, you want to read the first sure, slide? Sure. Thank you, since you already know it so well. When the potter's widow makes a pot, the use of the pot is precisely where there is nothing. Oh, I think I skipped one. Oh, I did not. Oh, they're just out of order. All right, so another prominent theme was non-existence. This is where we're going. So, this was the first one. It's out of order, so you can read that one. Sorry about that. Spokes, excuse me, are joined at the hub. Their use for the cart is where they are not. Mm. Mm. All right, so then it should have been this one. So the potter's wheel makes a pot. The use of the pot is precisely where there's nothing. Mm -hmm. It's like another big motif in uh, Taoist thought is uh, the useful, uselessness of things. Uh, in a lot of uh, Taoist texts, they, they praise hunchbacks and deformed people as like, like the epitome of creativity of the Tao because they're not following everything else. They're radically different, right? Um, Jim, you want to help me out on this one? <laughs> when you open doors and windows, it is where there is nothing that they are useful to the room. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, should be. Yes, so therefore, being is for benefit, non-being is for usefulness, mm. uh, <laughs> right? So this is what Andrew was, was picking at sections, but that's the whole chapter 11 for the Tao Te Ching. And this is exactly where Jim was tying in, like the receptivity of this feminine quality. And so what affinities do you guys think exist between the feminine and non-existence? And if there's any differences you guys see between the two? Because once again, I, I think the non-existence and the feminine just reek of potentiality like everything is structured around what it's not, right? So in a sense, if there's anything that is, it's what it's not that really gives it its defining characteristics. Mm. So it's kind of hard to work with these ideas, but I think this is, this is the crux of what he's working with and why he favors the feminine and the non-existing over the other That's people. a brilliant point, John, because in the West, what is God? I mean, God is uh, esse ipsum, the being itself or the highest being, right? Uh, it's uh, in Kant, uh, at the end of uh, Critique of Pure Reason B, 604, um, ins perfectissimum, the perfect being, uh, ins realissimum, the, the most real being, 
So being has priority and non-being is evil. So what is sin in uh, Augustine? Privatio boni, the absence of good. Sin, evil, is the space away from God. Here, what John just said is absolutely the opposite is true in Taoism. That's a mind-blowing insight. Like, if you're from the West, you should never forget that for the rest of your life. But here is the complementary approach to the entire Western set of presuppositions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Because here, the non-being makes the being possible. That's what you just said. Right. It defines it. It gives it. That is a mind-blowing insight. And so I think the priority is given because of that. I mean, you guys have any thoughts about that? I, when you first asked that, the first thing I thought about was a womb mm -hmm. that it is becomes a place for existence <clears throat> to grow. Yeah, you know, it becomes a place for birth and life. Right, right, almost out of nothing, right? Right. Just a womb. Right. One with the yang thing. Um, I shouldn't say thing. I kind of degrades it. The concept, <laughs> like. The nothingness still needs the somethingness in order to give the nothingness right. its usefulness. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, wait. In Taoism? No, nothingness has priority over somethingness. No, somethingness comes out of nothingness. Right. And so some of the commentaries I read, it's where you have nothing, <laughs> something, nothing. Like the something always comes from nothing, it always returns to nothing. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, it's given priority. So nothingness and non-being is different? Nothingness, yes. non-being is different? So some of the, the way that non-being is used, I try to avoid that because that sounds very Western, <coughs> like non-being as opposed to being, and that's seen as opposites, like diametrically opposite to one another. Whereas like non-existence, I'm trying to entail the, the potentiality that it contains within it. It's not just nothingness, but it has the potentiality to become something. Very nice. And actually, an even better translation might be beyond existing. Because oh, right. now it's beyond that mere category of exist existing, above it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or beneath it, actually, maybe we should say. Uh, you mean nothing is, is beyond existence? Beyond existing is the Tao. So non existing is pretty close, but the beyond, mm -hmm. beneath, given the. Anyway, sorry, Jay needs to go in and then. Uh, yeah. It's, it's not polarities. You can't think of it like polarities, like one or the other. You know, like one is generative of the other. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what Lao Tzu really draws out compared to other Taoist thinkers. Um, I was just wondering if this is similar to the Faberian and Kakushin, uh, if I will, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> insistence of God, or if that would be closer to what, like this language, or are they, is that still kind of a different category? I would say different categories. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I was just trying to wrap my mind around it. And I've read those books. So. Uh, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, John. Yeah, you can really, um, really helpful. I think that got to it. All right. Now we close this hour with your guys' activity. Everyone pull out Noah.